is Dominique. And for as long as I can remember, I have been quite the storyteller. Storytelling is an ancient tradition that traces its origins back to visual narratives, like cave drawings before evolving into oral traditions and epics, which have allowed stories to be passed down onto generations. Coming from Taos Pueblo, one of the oldest indigenous communities in the United States, whose entire history is detailed orally, I've always had a strong connection to stories. I believe that through stories, we have the ability to captivate, empower, and inspire. I believe that stories can be the means of understanding lessons in life, others, and even ourselves. And that is why today, I'd like to share a story with all of you. It was a cold and cloudy evening on August 2nd, 1948. Unbeknownst to most of the world, a young girl named Elsie was born. Like most children, she spent her early childhood outside. From sunrise to sunset, Elsie and her siblings played near the river that shaped the beautiful valley she called home. They played games that kept their heads in the clouds, but alas, the dark brown soil beneath their feet always kept them grounded. Wrapped in a community of relatives and connected to nature, life here had meaning. Then, during the drought-stricken summer of 1954, Elsie and her family left the one place they had called home for generations. Carrying their few belongings and little black trash bags and the few backpacks they could find, they boarded a train in northern New Mexico, bound for the bright and promising California. The reason for moving came from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a federal agency in the United States whose activities in the 20th century aimed at assimilating American Indians into mainstream culture by implementing policies that forced American Indians to adopt the language, customs, and values of American Europeans and to abandon all of their cultural heritage. Elsie watched from the window as the orange desert of New Mexico slowly blended into the green coast of California. Her fingers played with a broken seam at her shirt in an attempt to settle her excitement. Elsie had never been to a big city before. Upon arriving to Los Angeles, the large mass amount of people shocked her. And for the remainder of her journey, she remained tucked between her mother's legs. In 1953, the US Congress initiated a new policy of termination. Under this policy, American Indians would be disbanded, torn apart, and their land would be sold. To complement such a policy, the Bureau of Indian Affairs introduced the Urban Relocation Program, a voluntary program in which it facilitated American Indians' travel from rural tribal areas to urban centers like Chicago, Denver, and Los Angeles. Those who relocated were promised assistance in finding housing and employment. However, those who actually relocated encountered many difficulties, including unemployment, discrimination, and the complete collapse of cultural support systems. Overall, this was a clear attempt by the United States government to propel assimilation and cut federal funding. One Bureau of Indian Affairs commissioner later called the program an underfunded, ill-conceived program, essentially a one-way ticket from rural to urban poverty. Unknown to Elsie, she would become, would be among one of the, thou the thousands of Native Americans who were forcibly relocated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs between 1953 and 1972. Elsie's initial infatuation with her environment quickly disappeared as her new school's strict curriculum and teaching methods often left little room for deviation from the norm. At school, Elsie attempted to make friends, but unfortunately no one else spoke Tiwa, the non-written language of her people. In the classroom, Elsie feared being called on, to which she'd have to rise from her seat whenever asked, a question. Each time Elsie's eyes filled with tears as she was unable to answer even the simplest questions in English. 
Slowly, the days wedged together as Elsie fell more and more behind her peers. Eventually, she was moved to the back of the classroom after being deemed disruptive for speaking in T1. Ruth Underhill, an anthropologist and Bureau of Indian Affairs official, once said, I've always felt that the problem of the Navajo is the fact that they're Navajo. I believe that they should get off their reservation and become a citizen just like everybody else. To cease to be a Navajo, in other words. Elsie shared a smile with her new friend as she read aloud. Her new friend was a young Mexican girl that had moved in next door. Like Elsie, she also did not speak English, but by the age of nine, they had both taught themselves how to read and write. Elsie's triumph, however, would go unnoticed by her parents, as the Bureau of Indian Affairs' broken promises caused more detrimental effects to their family. Combined with the increasing financial burdens that essentially crushed Elsie's parents, they turned to alcohol to escape their turmoil. At school events, Elsie would look to the stands and search for her parents, but deep down, deep down she knew they weren't there. Elsie became accustomed to watching her peers get to hug their parents, and she wished one day she could just go back home to the mountains where life once had meaning. Eventually, due to limited job opportunities, Elsie and her family once again packed up all their belongings and moved, this time, to a city known as Bellflower, a small city southeast of Los Angeles. Here, Elsie attended a white majority high school and was the only Native American student. Each day, Elsie pushed herself harder and harder and harder, but it just seemed no matter how hard she tried, she would never be good enough. At school, she was once again pushed aside. She attempted once again to make friends, but it didn't work. According to some teachers, she simply was uh, a kid that didn't want to learn. But Elsie's heart ached each time she heard her teachers and peers' comments like, have you seen her clothes? Have you seen her clothes? Have you seen her parents? It's no wonder she's turned out this way. Escaping the constant clamor at school, Elsie would walk home where each day she passed by an establishment whose window sign read, Indians not welcome. Time like this continued until in 1964, Elsie met Richard at the age of 16, a young man. That same year, they married, ran away together, and Elsie became pregnant. At this point in time, there was zero contact between Elsie and her parents. So the, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs had succeeded in that respect, tearing families apart. To support her own family, Elsie took on three jobs and followed Richard city to city wherever he could find work. Fortunately enough, Elsie was able to return to school and pursue an account, a career in accounting. And she became certified as a public accountant. However, during this time, she was diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome, a condition that causes numbness and pain in the hands and can eventually lead to permanent nerve damage. As a result, no establishment would hire her. See, Elsie had always been good at math. And you have the one thing you're good at, the one thing that's close to you be taken away by something so, so close to you, yet so completely out of your control. It was heartbreaking. Eventually, Elsie and her, her four children and Richard moved back to their home in the mountains. Here on her reservation, a land governed by her tribal nation, she learned to be, bake bread, and make pottery. Connecting back to her ancestral roots felt revitalizing and gave her a sense of belonging, something she had felt was absent most of her adolescence. However, Tragedy struck once again in 1994, when Richard, while at work, collapsed. He was ordered to undergo a biopsy. 
However, during his hospitalization, he once again lost consciousness and was pronounced brain dead. The biopsy results revealed the presence of metastatic lymphoma cancer. Richard had kept his, his sickness a secret from Elsie and their children for unknown reasons for months. Eventually, that same year, Elsie had to make the devastating and disheartening decision to take Richard off of life support. Chimamanda Adichie once said, many stories have meaning. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign. But stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. My family and my people have experienced one of the more recent and lesser known instances of ethnic cleansing carried out by the United States government on indigenous people. The story that I have just shared with all of you today was my grandmother's, Elsie Erickson's story. In present day, my grandmother currently lives in Nevada. She is currently caring for her grandchildren who are expecting children. When initially asked to participate in my TEDx speech, she wanted me to mention the little girl who, who in elementary school helped her learn to read and write. She wanted me to mention her children who she loves unconditionally, and finally, her grandchildren who she believes are good to her. When reflecting on her journey, there isn't a single aspect my grandmother would change, as she believes it encompasses all the splendid facets of life, including love, hardship, sorrow, and joy. All of which she believes have served to be poignant reminders of all the beauty life has to offer. And that is why, as a storyteller, I want to leave you with a few words of encouragement I hope that all of you in the audience one day can share your stories just as my grandmother has done today. And please keep in mind all of those beautiful and splendid facets of life. Ba'a. Thank you.